Kalani Ricketts. On the, uh, it, were you here this morning in Oklahoma City? The morning of April 19th, 1995 was so similar to this morning. Absolutely breathtaking Oklahoma spring day. The clou clouds were nowhere to be seen. The sky was blue. The temperatures were in the 60s. It was a gorgeous spring day, and we all set about doing those things that we do on a gorgeous Oklahoma spring morning. We go to work. So that morning, I was set to go to a hearing at our federal courthouse, which is directly south of what was the Murrah Building. And I was about 10 blocks north of here, north and a little bit to the west. And we're all sitting at a traffic intersection. And all of a sudden, everybody's cars do this. And then you hear a boom. And then you saw smoke rising from downtown Oklahoma City. Now, if you're under the age of 30, this may be something you're not going to believe. But at that time, cell phones were attached to the car. Yeah, I know. And so I reached, yeah, I reached for the cell phone I had that was attached to the car and called the television station and said, well, what's going on? And they said, we don't know. The helicopters are going up. We're trying to get a look. And this is about 9.04 AM. Understand the bomb went off at 9.02. So they told me the best thing I could do at that point would be to drive straight into downtown Oklahoma City and meet up with a photographer and a live truck operator so that we could begin reporting from the scene. Understand, I am coming in from the west. The TV stations in Oklahoma City are all on the east side of what we call Broadway Extension Highway 77. So they would have been on the east side of the Murrah Building, the Journal Record Building that you're in now. And so we're all converging into downtown. The TV crews are driving in. And it may be one of the first time nobody got a ticket for passing a highway patrol trooper. Because most of the cars on the highway at that point in time actually pulled over to try to figure out what was going on. Because there is, they have all felt the percussion from the bomb and then seen the smoke. And they pulled over to try to figure out exactly what's going on. Everybody's making their phone calls. So I drive in. And the one thing that you immediately notice as you begin clo getting close to downtown Oklahoma City is there is not a pane of glass left in a building. Any glass that was the frontage, and this is a downtown business area, any glass that was the frontage of the building is now lying on the ground in a thousand different pieces. If you uh, have studied your physics or studied anything, you know that the sound wave is going to begin to shatter glass. There will be, by the time the trials are over, by the time many things are over, we will have discovered that so many, many of the injuries that occurred that day occurred from flying glass. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what happened after that to begin to change the way buildings are made now due to Oklahoma City. But I began to run as quickly as I could into downtown Oklahoma City to try to, towards the Murrah Building, which the helicopters have now determined it's the Murrah Building, which is what they're telling me. I discovered I was one of the few people inside my TV station that knew which one was the Murrah Building and which one was the Federal Building, which was kind of a rude awakening at that point in time. Because I, take, I made it all the way down to the building and could see the devastation from where I was and then began to backtrack so that I could meet with the photographer and the live truck operator. So many of the crews that came in from the east side, because triage, the, the work that was being done with the, the walking wounded, the survivors that day, was being done in front of where you are now, in front of the Journal Record Building on the east side. They thought that's where the explosion had occurred because there was so much smoke there were parking lots. Cars were still catching fire and exploding from the heat and from the percussion that had occurred that you really, if you were on the ground on the east side of the building, could not see. It would be about 20 or 30 minutes before they would realize that they needed to go on around the corner as far as they could go. 
So I, I am on the west side. I meet up with the photographer and the live truck operator, and we begin reporting live. I'm funny uh, in that I would not use the word bomb until it was used by a police officer, a firefighter, someone in a position of authority, because come on, this is downtown Oklahoma City. N you n never have your mind wrapped around the concept that somebody would put a bomb in a truck and drive it in front of a building in Oklahoma City and blow it up. That's still hard to wrap your head around. But uh, eventually, uh, John Hansen with the Oklahoma City Fire Department uh, came up to me and I said, is it? And he said, yes, it was a bomb. So we've now confirmed on the air, confirmed period, that a bomb was set off in downtown Oklahoma City. We are continuing to report live. I wouldn't realize until almost 3 o'clock in the morning when I got to go home and take a shower that we were not just broadcasting in Oklahoma City, that everyone around this country, places like Nebraska, were watching us live, and that we were actually being watched around the world. I got home and my answering machine had a voicemail from a friend of mine that was living in Denmark at the time, going, I saw you on TV, and I'm going, uh-oh. I wonder what I looked like. <laughs> because one of the things that had happened um, when we were reporting was when, when a reporter is reporting, you notice you, you see what's going on behind them. That means their back is to whatever is going on. Photographer is facing what's going on. So we're reporting, and we are watching and talking to these streams of people. God love the rescue workers, the nurses, and the doctors that were running into the danger area at that point in time, directly towards the Murrah building. And so my back is to him. So I'm looking at the photographer, and all of a sudden he starts looking around the camera. I'm kind of like, okay. And he keeps doing it. So what's going on? Well, I'm, I understand for the past 45 minutes people have been running towards the building. I turn around, now they're running at us. What had happened was the call had gone out that there was possibly a second bomb in the building. It turned out to be a dummy ornament, ornam, ordinance, thank you, I'm trying, ordinance that was used by the Bureau of Alcohol, and by DEA, I'm sorry, for uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms was using it for some demonstrations and some other things like that. But they had pushed us back at that point about eight blocks so in order to be able to see anything, we began to climb up the outside rung ladder to the top of a transmission building. And ladies, that's what I had on. <laughs> At one point in time, those made it onto national TV. So everybody had to call and leave me messages about how I needed a new pair of high heels, <laughs> which I thought was a very strange thing to call me at two o'clock in the morning when a bomb had gone off to tell me about my high heels. People do strange things when they're a little bit concerned about you. But they, we would stay on top of that transmission building for about the next two hours to continue to do live shots from where we were. And then you, if you've been in the area of reporting on terrorism, you'll see the area that is called, they ended up calling Satellite City. That's the area they eventually moved us into. They began to set up the crime tape and perimeter around there. So once we have established a bomb has gone off, once the FBI has moved in, Oklahoma City Police, the State Bureau of Investigation, any law enforcement agent available has moved in. The president has notified FEMA and what is called urban search and rescue teams were beginning to work their way uh, on airplane towards Oklahoma City along with every television station that is probably somewhere in about a 500 mile proximity and the others were flying in by airplane. So suddenly this was a very large city. Urban search and rescue, I'll tell you more about in a minute, but became a vital part of the, not only the investigation, but the search and rescue operation that was going on. FBI moved in at that point in time to try to determine what the bomb was and who had in fact set off the bomb. Two o'clock in the morning when I made it back to the TV station, 
the question not only was how many had been injured, how many had survived, how many had been killed, why Oklahoma City, the next question had to become who had done this. So the FBI began working on that along with the federal law enforcement agencies and within two days after the bombing, that became my job as, as a part of the investigation into what had happened here. Even I uh, was here in Oklahoma City talking to a variety of different law enforcement agencies and we get the phone call that a man by the name of Timothy McVeigh, understand there were several things leading up to this, a man by the name of Timothy McVeigh was being held in the Perry County Courthouse, Perry, in the Noble County Courthouse, Perry, Oklahoma, about 90 miles north of Oklahoma City, straight up I-35. <coughs> he had been in the Noble County Jail since about an hour, two hours after the Oklahoma City bombing, and the FBI wanted him and believed that was the person who had set off the bomb in Oklahoma City. The word I got uh, later would be that they had gotten McVeigh's name. A, they found the piece of the Ryder truck in front of the Regency Tower. When you go outside, you'll see a very large apartment building next door. A piece of the Ryder truck that was used and held the bomb had the vehicle identification number on it parts of trucks and cars have VIN numbers on them. That was found. They traced it back to Junction City. They then got a description from the guy who had rented the truck. Those descriptions went out on TV and into newspapers. A guy in Buffalo, New York contacted the FBI in Buffalo saying, I think I know that guy. He's an anti-government fanatic. I worked with him as a security guard and his name is Timothy McVeigh. All of this is happening in a 48-hour period of time. So now ATF and DEA and FBI and all those other letter things that make up the federal government's law enforcement are making phone calls around Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, asking <coughs> if anybody had come across, ticketed a Timothy McVeigh. Well, it was an ATF agent, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms that made the phone call into Noble County. They said, yeah, Oklahoma Highway Patrol Trooper arrested him because he didn't have a car tag and he had a gun and a holster underneath his arm. And we put him in jail that day and we haven't had a chance or a judge, so he's getting ready to go before the judge. And they said, well, you just swing that bad boy around, put him back in jail, and we're coming for him. Coming for him was four FBI helicopters, 10 news helicopters, an OSB, a South Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation helicopter, and I don't know how many other helicopters, and a screaming line of law enforcement that really stretched a long way, and followed by the TV news crews. All of them streaming up I-35 this time instead of south on I-35. Everybody converged on the courthouse, and that's where the pictures you will see of Timothy McVeigh being walked out in the bulletproof vest came from. They're from the Noble County Courthouse. So they're going to bring him back to Oklahoma City, and the way our justice system works, you stand before a judge and hear the charges against you. Where did I say I was going the morning of the bombing? Federal Courthouse. And the Federal Courthouse was so what do you think the federal courthouse in Oklahoma City looked like? Because this is a federal crime, it's a federal building. Ceilings were gone, the electricity is off, and they are that far from a crime scene. So if you are going to, it's all right, mine went off a minute ago. Uh, if you're gonna go and have somebody stand before a judge, one of the things that is so wonderful about this country and the rules that we have created to govern it also says that a courtroom, when the charges are presented against you and through those proceedings, will be open. There will be a witness, someone there, besides a judge and the law enforcement in you, to ensure that the system works. Well, the one place you could bring Timothy McVeigh that was secure, number one, and number two, you could put him before a judge, in Oklahoma City was Tinker Air Force Base. Well, there's one thing about Tinker Air Force Base, like all military bases, you just can't walk on it. 
So they're going to bring these helicopters into Tinker Air Force Base, and they're going to bring Timothy McVeigh before a judge. And, and so all of us little reporters are standing there going, we want in. You got to let us in. You've got to have somebody there. So they drew business cards literally out of a coffee can. And I was one of the reporters that went into Tinker Air Force Base. That would become the first hearing for Timothy McVeigh that I went to. The last one I would go to would be his execution in Terre Haute, Indiana. During the period of time that he was in Oklahoma's, Oklahoma, he would be first at the Oklahoma County Jail and then at our medium security federal prison in El Reno, which is about 45 minutes from here. The next time after the decision was made to move the trials to Colorado, for venue purposes, and not a bad decision, it ended up working out well, was he, they would be held first in one prison and then in the maximum uh, prison, maximum security federal prison, literally built into a mountain up in Colorado, while he would stand trial and the place where Terry Nichols still is. But during the time that he was in Oklahoma, it was about December, understand the bombings in April, it was around December, it was December. Um, Timothy McVeigh's attorneys decided to hold what we sarcastically, as reporters, called a beauty contest for reporters. You would have certain reporters were selected and you had a half an hour to go in, meet Timothy McVeigh, talk to him only under a limited set of circumstances, ask him very limited questions, very controlled questions, and try to see if you could convince him to do the interview with you. I was one of the reporters that was chosen to do that. So I spent a half an hour with Timothy McVeigh in a federal prison over in El Reno, Oklahoma, trying to convince him that an Oklahoma reporter needed to tell the story, needed to do the interview. I lost that opportunity to 60 minutes. I'm not surprised. But I gave it my best shot. But also during that period of time, what I did was open a line of communication, a series of letters. I would write letters, I would send him information on different things he was interested in, continuing to try to get that moment where we could do that interview, get him to answer a few questions, find out a few things. But also being very, very cognizant of the fact that any communication I had with Timothy McVeigh would also raise concerns and questions with the survivors and the victims. Very aware of that. During that same period of time, I had gotten an opportunity to meet with a group of, there were different victims groups that were organized, some of them by mutual concern, some of them by things they wanted to do, some of them had lost, all, all of them had lost children, some, all of them had lost a certain family member. They were all a uh, family of federal agents different groups that had formed, but one group that I connected with knew that there were certain rules and regulations about trials, and if Timothy McVeigh and eventually Terry Nichols, the other man convicted in this crime, were to go on trial, that they would not be able to sit in the courtroom if they were going to testify in a death penalty portion or sentencing portion of this trial. So they decided to organize and go to Congress and get a law passed that if the only thing they were going to testify to, the only thing they were going to go and tell a judge and jury from a witness stand was about their family member, there was no reason to prevent them from going into the courtroom. They changed that law. They were able to sit in on the trial and still testify in Timothy McVeigh's death portion and Terry Nichols life sentencing portion of the trial. There were actually three people who were charged to some extent with the crime. Timothy McVeigh sentenced to die, Terry Nichols sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, came to Oklahoma, was tried again, also sentenced to life without the possibility of, of uh, parole, and Michael Fortier. Michael Fortier and his wife, Lori, knew them from the time that Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols were in the Army and would travel to Arizona to see them. 
and knew about the bombing, help them plan portions of them, create fake IDs, do diagrams of the bomb that would be created. Michael Fortier struck a deal with the prosecution. He would testify against Timothy McVeigh, Terry Nichols, do nine years in prison. His wife would not have to testify and they would go into witness protection after it was all over. <coughs> that has all happened. He is out of prison. We have no idea where he is and I don't know that anybody really wants to know. The, the one thing I will tell the young people in this room is that one of the things that had created the bond between the three of them and the thing that led to their paranoia of the federal government and the things that were going on in this world was a thing called methamphetamine. They did meth and it made them paranoid and it made them more than a little bit crazy. So I'm not saying everybody who does meth will blow up a building, but I'm saying there's a good chance. So no drugs, just say no. So that it, that's a real broad overview. I would spend two years in Denver with the trials watching both <laughs> Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols uh, being found guilty. I would continue, uh, I'm sorry, I got lost somewhere in the middle of that. With that group of victims that I said had gone to Washington, got it created, we also, before McVeigh would write a letter that did have something in it that would go on the air, I would meet with that group, something we had never done before, something we had never done since, and we would show them the letter and say, this is what I have, and this is what we're going to air tomorrow night or the nex next, within the next two nights. They couldn't control the story. They couldn't change what we were going to do. But what we wanted to do was take away the element of surprise. There would not be a tease on the TV news going, what does Timothy McVeigh say to Terry Watkins today? The surprise element could be gone. And with that, some of the shock value of it for them. That is the courtesy, that is the least we could do. And so that was something, there were so many things that were done differently during that time. But our job as reporters during that period wasn't just to find out what was going on, but to help lead a community through one of the worst disasters in this country's history. And to help to bring, there's no such thing as closure. Don't anybody ever let you use that word. There's no such thing but to help bring us to the other side of it, to take us as the memorial does from 901 to 903, to get those moments not behind us, but allow us the opportunity to bring them into our lives, to make them a part of us, and to move forward. This community changed. There is no question about that. Timothy McVeigh hated the federal government. He wanted to start a revolution. Instead, he created a strength in this town and in this state that cannot be broken. We learned how strong we are that day. When the call would go out, and that was the other vehicle we could do, when the call would go out that they needed gloves for the workers downtown, you couldn't find a set of gloves in this town within a half an hour. They'd need batteries, or they'd need this, or they'd need that. The, one of the convention centers that day had a res the restaurant association for the state of Oklahoma was having a conference. Conference shut down, they start cooking for the families, for the volunteers, for the police officers. <coughs> the FEMA, my favorite story in the world, FEMA workers, I told you, Urban Search and Rescue came in from all over the country, from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from Dallas. They came here to help look for survivors and when there was no more survivors to be found to help bring victims back to the families. And they would do a floor by floor search of this building, so with some of them with dogs, some of them by hand. Also working with the FBI, who would have to sift, literally sift through pieces of a nine story building trying to find the evidence that would eventually be used to convict McVeigh and Nichols. But the FEMA workers, when they came into town, they would be housed at one of the office buildings that was here in the downtown area. 
And they'd set up cots and done different things and had them over also at the convention center. And they had chiropractors and they brought dogs with them. They had vets, they had doctors, they had beauticians. Somebody said a hot tub would be nice to relax in and there were hot tubs in downtown. If these people who had come to help us, these people who cared enough to give up a part of their life, their time, to come to Oklahoma City, they were our heroes and we would treat them as such. As one of the FEMA workers, the urban search and rescue workers, was ready to leave Oklahoma, our governor stood and came to uh, downtown to shake the hands and we sh each one of them and thank them, which each one well as they went back. One of the urban search and rescue workers pulled a dollar out of his pocket looked at the governor and said, you know what that is? He said, a dollar. Our governor was smart. It's a dollar. He went, no, that's an Oklahoma dollar. That's the dollar I had when I came here, and that's the dollar that's still in my pocket when I leave. We call it the Oklahoma standard. You come, you're our neighbor, you're our friend, you're our family. We're here to help you, and we'll reach out a hand. And we're returning the favor Victims' families, survivors' families have traveled to New York multiple times. They go into hurricane zones. They go into wherever we are needed. That isn't just us, folks. That's America. We are not the country that Timothy McVeigh envisioned. We're neighbors, we're friends, we're family. We're the people that help at our church. He forgot that, or he never learned it but we believe in an Oklahoma standard, so we welcome you to the great state of Oklahoma. That's my story. Do you guys have any questions? I always like questions. Can I start here? Yes, sir. He rented it up in Junction City, Kansas, and he and Terry Nichols stole the different things from different places that they needed to build the bomb. And so you were at a building now? No. Let me go over here first. Yes, sir. You know, it's funny. I think I learned things about myself that you kind of go, I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know that I wouldn't fall apart trying to help people. I wouldn't fall apart standing there watching what we were watching. So you learn there's a strength and an honor to what you do. And it sometimes keeps you from being bitter about things. So is there a box that I hide some of the things I saw? Sure. And don't want to relive them? Yeah. But I try to remember things like the story of the Sandy and the things that I saw people capable well beyond what they were capable of doing. Construction workers who had never been trained to go through something like this that were down there, 14-hour shifts, pulling rubble out of a building so a family could have their loved ones remain but you drive down a street in East Oklahoma City and you see a hundred caskets lying there. Those are memories you, you don't forget, but maybe they're things that make us better. I try to hope so. Young lady there and then I'll come here. Yes, I knew a couple of the federal uh, law enforcement agents that died. Yes, sir. And then we'll go. What happened to them? What? Which people? We lost 168 people. They died. Yeah, we did. all those things that go in your mind at the same time.
that one human being could do that to other human beings. Yes. Yes, sir. There were some federal agents that were stuck in there, and you might be able to see some pictures. Some of them were stuck clear up on the ninth floor, and they were waving for help, and they were able to get fire trucks and other things up there to help them. Yes, ma'am. I did not. It was, again, a lottery. You know, it was funny to have your name drawn for every single hearing up into the point of execution, and my name was not drawn at the execution. And it was funny because his lawyer told me afterwards I was one of the people he was looking for. So maybe I'm glad I wasn't there. There's nothing like Timothy McVeigh lying on a gurney going, hi, Terry. That would not have been good. Yes. I'd ask him why. I still don't know why completely. Then maybe I'd slap his face. Yes, ma'am. No. If you stopped, you couldn't go on. Yes, ma'am. There were a couple of different reasons that were given. Some of them he gave to reporters from his hometown of Buffalo that it was, been, it was retaliation for what had happened in a place called Waco, David Koresh incident. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. There was, uh, most of it was cars and things, gasoline and in cars and things like that that were associated, but there was a lot of smoke. Like you saw after 9-11, dust and debris from collapsing concrete. <coughs> yes, sir. To McVeigh? Yeah. Oh, no, it was closer than me to her. Called us up. He believed he was doing something that would change the country. No. Weasel. One word description for Terry. I, yeah, I'm not opinionated about this or anything. The man's a weasel. He's sitting in a federal prison, life without parole, and he's complaining because he can't get food with fiber in it. I know a whole lot of people that'll send him fiber. But it won't look like oatmeal bread. <laughs> yes, sir. About, I'm sorry? Oh, the way people react in urban sorrow? I'm sorry. On, on, on you said, uh, um, I wish we'd had a team. We do now. I think there are some that need to be more strategically placed around the country uh, because urban search and rescue, we've used so many times in building disasters without teaching them the things that happened in like our communities of Woodward in the tornado or Joplin. I think they can be used very effectively and efficiently in those areas. I was amazed at the talent and dedication that they had and their willingness to give up their lives. The, those people are commendable to me, but I would like to see more of them spread out. I'd like to see one at least in every state. Yes, ma'am. Judge Richard Mage of Denver, Colorado was the judge that would preside over the trials. I have never been more impressed by a federal judge. Those trials were handled efficiently, expeditiously. They were done with courtesy and decorum to all sides, both for Terry Nichols and Timothy McVeigh. They were fair, but they weren't drug out forever. Both sides got their opportunity. It was amazing to sit there day after day. Six, six 